In a male, for instance, that has very high testosterone, some of that is going to be converted into estrogen by aromatase. And aromatase is made by body fat. It's also made in the testes themselves. You could find multiple papers that showed that apnea or poor efficiency of breathing and buildup of too much carbon dioxide in the body was a problem. Apnea in general was shown to be an issue negatively impacting hormones. Now, the directionality of this effect isn't entirely clear. It could be that reductions in estrogen cause apnea. Testosterone reductions were associated with apnea. There are very clear ways in which patterns of breathing, especially patterns of breathing in sleep, can modulate hormones in ways that are immediately actionable and can serve to optimize testosterone. One of the main behaviors that's been shown to be associated with lower levels of testosterone is apnea. Apnea has everything to do with under breathing and the buildup of too much carbon dioxide in the body. But if there's a consistent literature in this whole story about aging and reductions in hormones and general health and reductions in hormones, it's apnea. In every case, you could find multiple papers that showed that apnea or poor efficiency of breathing and buildup of too much carbon dioxide in the body was a problem, mostly sleep apnea, although apnea in general was shown to be an issue negatively impacting hormones. Now, that was true for males and females, but what's really interesting is that there are very clear ways in which patterns of breathing, especially patterns of breathing in sleep, can modulate hormones in ways that are immediately actionable and can serve to optimize both estrogen and testosterone, regardless of whether or not you have ovaries or testes. So what is apnea? Apnea is under breathing or mainly cessation of breathing during sleep. So people are holding their breath and then they'll, they'll suddenly wake up. I should have talked about the physiological sigh on previous episodes of this podcast of this pattern of double inhales followed by exhales that one can do consciously to reduce stress and anxiety and offload carbon dioxide. That pattern of breathing is actually what kicks in spontaneously anytime we have an apnea episode in sleep. Although in many people who have apnea, they don't engage the physiological sigh. People who are dramatically overweight also suffer a lot from apnea during sleep. There's actually a lot of buildup of carbon dioxide in the body, and that can lead to excessive sleepiness during the day, inability to access the deeper phases of sleep. And it's well established that going into deep sleep and getting the proper patterns of slow wave sleep and REM sleep are important for hormone optimization. The issue of breathing itself can be adjusted in the daytime waking hours in ways that can powerfully impact both sleep, reduce incidence of sleep apnea, and apparently from some emerging literature can also help to optimize various hormones even just by breathing in particular ways while awake. So here's how this works. There's now a lot of literature showing that breathing through the nose, not through the mouth, is powerful for improving lots of things. First of all, it improves cosmetic features of the jaw and face. This was first well established by my colleagues at Stanford in a book called Jaws. The Story of a Hidden Epidemic, this is by Sandra Kahn and Paul Ehrlich, who are both uh, faculty at Stanford, has a foreword by Robert Sapolsky, the great Robert Sapolsky, and uh, it also has a heavy endorsement up front by Jared Diamond, the author of uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, the Pulitzer winner. So a lot of heavy hitters on this book, Jaws. It's not a book that a lot of people know about, unfortunately, but it really describes the benefits of nasal breathing and the terrible things that happen when people, in particular children, but adults also, are heavy mouth breathers. So mouth breathers have changes in the cosmetics of their face and jaw that are really bad um, in terms of att uh, attractiveness. And this was done in twin studies. You can look in the book and see some of this. It's really dramatic how being a mouth breather tends to make the chin drop back be behind the upper mandible. There's a lengthening of the face, a drooping of the eyes. It can be quite dramatic or modest depending on how much mouth breathing. Now, sometimes we have to breathe with our mouths, but there's also a lot of data and studies described in this book, Jaws, that describe how nose breathing in wakefulness and in sleep promotes all sorts of positive things related to not just cosmetics, but also the improvement of gas exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the body. And as well, it can modify levels of different neurotransmitters and neuromodulators in ways that positively can impact hormones. So believe it or not, being a nasal breather and avoiding being a mouth breather can actually positively impact hormones and in particular the hormones testosterone and estrogen. Although the way that it does that 
is by making you a better sleeper, which allows you to produce more testosterone. So what does this all mean? This means we have to be breathing properly. It almost sounds kind of, uh, you know, uh, like kind of new agey, like, oh, you have to breathe properly, to get your hormones right. But no, you have to breathe properly to get your breathing and sleep right so that your sleep can actually be deep enough and you're not entering apnea states. And then that will support gonad function. A few years ago, there was a lot of excitement about the hormone DHEA, which is mainly made by the adrenals. DHEA has been promoted as kind of a catch-all for increasing testosterone and estrogen in males. And the extent to which it increases one or the other will depend on whether or not you're starting off with more estrogen than testosterone, or whether or not you're starting off with more testosterone than estrogen, and whether or not you have a lot of aromatase. So for individuals that have a lot of aromatase being made by the testes or by body fat, if you take DHEA, there's a good chance that a, a fair portion of that is going to be shuttled towards estrogen production and not towards testosterone production. Whereas in individuals that have low levels of testosterone to begin with high levels of estrogen, there's a good chance that the DHEA is going to promote mainly estrogen production. Getting your breathing right during the waking hours, meaning primarily unless you're working out really hard or there's some other reason why you're maybe eating or speaking that you need to be breathing through your mouth, you should be a nose breather. There's really good evidence for that now. And in sleep, you also want to be a nose breather because that's going to increase the amount of oxygen that you're bringing into your system and the amount of carbon dioxide that you're offloading. There are other positive effects of it as well, but you're basically reducing apnea. So the simple version of this is get your breathing right. So how do you do that? How do you get your breathing right? Well, for some people that have severe sleep apnea, they are going to need the CPAP machine. This is a machine that you actually put on your face and it helps you breathe properly in sleep. Many people, however, are starting to do this thing of taping their mouth shut. Now, this sounds a little bit extreme and you certainly don't want to uh, do this in any way that's dangerous. In the daytime, the best way to get good at nasal breathing is to dilate the nasal passages because a lot of people have a hard time breathing through their nose. And one way to do this is to just breathe through your nose more. And one way to do that is that when you exercise, in particular cardiovascular exercise, most of the time, provided you're not in maximum effort, you should be nasal breathing. Now, for a lot of people, nasal breathing during exercise is hard at first, but as you do it, because the sinuses have a capacity to dilate over time, you'll get better at it if you want to understand how light can impact hormones because hormones, light, and dopamine have a very close-knit relationship, so much so that your light-viewing behavior can actually have a direct effect on hormone levels. Viewing bright light with the eyes in the middle of the circadian night has a detrimental effect on dopamine and therefore has a detrimental effect on things like testosterone and estrogen. In the summer months, when days are longer and it's warmer, humans tend to make more testosterone relative to the other months of the year. So now let's talk about how exercise in its various forms, weight training, endurance work, weight training to failure, or less intense weight training, can impact testosterone levels. What you find in general is that weight training with heavy loads, so anywhere from one rep maximum to somewhere in the you know six to eight rep repetition range, in males increases testosterone significantly and it does it for about a day, sometimes up to 48 hours. Endurance activity, if performed first, leads to decreases in testosterone during the weight training session as compared to the same weight training session done first followed by endurance activity. In other words, if you want to optimize testosterone levels, it seems to be the case that weight training first and doing cardio type endurance activity afterward is the right order of business. Now, when these are done on separate days, it doesn't seem to have an effect. There is, they showed no statistical interaction. But it seems that if you're going to do these in the same workout episode, that it's move heavy loads first, then do cardiovascular exercise. So there's a little bit of data looking specifically at how endurance exercise impacts testosterone and its derivatives. And it's very clear that high intensity interval training, sprinting, etc., which somewhat mimics the neural activity that occurs while moving heavy weight loads is going to increase testosterone. Now there's an entire industry devoted to supplements and various things that people can take to increase testosterone. Some of which have scientific data to support them, uh, some of which do not, and some of which have anecdotal support and some of which do not. It has a huge industry because of the powerful effects that it has.